Rock The Rock Pile Report. The pettiest, hardest drinking Bills podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Rock Pile Report podcast. I'm your host, Bills season ticket holder, Drew Gear. That's my producer, Chris Krueger. And we are here. Chris, it's so crazy. Week six already. Does it feel like this much time has gone by in the NFL season? No. It's gone by fast. It's already October, and I feel like like we had two tailgates, right? Yeah. Two home games so far this season. And they feel so long ago. Yeah, because we got a three game road trip. It's nuts. And, and it's it's gonna be the way that it's trending for us with two losses on the on the road. It's going to be insane when we get to that Titans game, especially if we lose Monday night to the Jets with a brand new coach. Man, it's... We're here talking about our week six preview, Buffalo Bills and the New York Jets. Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard, the place over there in the Meadowlands in New Jersey, uh, East Rutherford, to be exact. The line in the game is interesting bills plus one so road underdogs but only slightly chris who do we have on the call who is it is it monday night aikman and buck okay and weather east rutherford new jersey we're looking at clear skies cold october like perfect football weather perfect 63 degrees some injuries to monitor ahead of the game For Buffalo, we came out of Houston with no new injuries other than our pride and just a national belief in Sean (laughs) McDermott. Those are the only things that got damaged in this game. Although maybe Josh Allen's brain. Allegedly. Allegedly. Injuries demanded for Buffalo are going to be cornerback to Ron Johnson, who is last week he was practicing in a non-contact jersey, but ramping up. You know, they say it's a four week injury. That was week five. This is going to be week six. It seems like he should be ready to go, right? Yeah. Defensive tackle Ed Oliver. Missing the game, you noticed we missed Ed Oliver this week. Did I think, we? Yeah, because I think that, <laughs> well, because think about it. They're often the interior offensive line's not great. And at the same time, how many people got their hands on the quarterback and just didn't bring him down? Yeah. That Anybody happened. else we could have thrown. At the quarterback this past week would have helped. Wide receiver Khalil Shakir might be the biggest one of all. Yep. You know, we had no no wide receiver separation to speak of. I've got numbers to back that up and here in tonight's keys to victory. His presence is going to do a crazy amount for the Buffalo Bills if he's good to go. And for the New York Jets, they've got their own problems. Morgan Moses might be coming back. Might be. And if he's not, Olaf Ashanu is going to start again at right tackle, playing out of position. He looked terrible this past week. Cornerback uh, Michael Carter Jr., who was like he was their starting nickel cornerback, but he wasn't great. He was gettable, if you're talking about it from an offensive standpoint. Uh, he pulled a hamstring in the first quarter of the, the, this week's game against the Vikings and was immediately ruled out. And then quarterback Aaron Rodgers suffers a low ankle sprain. Now he's out there at practice. He's doing all the things, but we'll see how the week goes. Because Chris, watching him crawl off the field, you can tell me that guy is okay. I don't believe you. No. He's taking a beating only six weeks into the season. Like there's almost a part of you that wonders if he didn't get lucky last year that he got hurt right away. Rather than having to sustain just a massive, massive amount of contact prior to finally getting hurt. It's a wild time in the AFC East, boys and girls. It really is. The Buffalo Bills are fresh off a really stinging loss. Not because I thought we were the better team going into it, but because due to injury and game script, like the fact that they lost Nico Collins completely tilted things in Buffalo's favor. It did. And you watched Buffalo start to make a comeback after that point. It could have been ours, and just our own ineptitude didn't allow it. Meanwhile, the Buffalo Bills are fresh off a really stinging loss, 
And here's the Jets coming off their own just showing of their asses on national TV. And they've now, as of today, doubled down on being one of the most laughable and volatile organizations in the NFL by firing their head coach under really awkward circumstances. Like there's a Mangini, you know, Eric Mangini went on air to say that he heard rumblings that there could be a move made last week saying that the reason is that Woody Johnson is the former ambassador to the UK was going to have all of his highfalutin friends around. And that if they lost this game, he would be so embarrassed. He would be forced to make changes, which is hilarious. You're not firing the coach because it's the right thing. You're hiring him because you're embarrassed. And the problem is where you would give some franchises and some owners the benefit of the doubt. You can't give that to Woody Johnson because he's been nothing but a moron when it comes to any of this. (sighs) They've been lampooned by their own fan base and local media like pointing out that replacing the head coach only fixes their problems ostensibly (laughs) because what Jeff Elbrook is going to do what for their offense, which is the reason they're losing games. Well, you weren't going to give you weren't going to give that job to Nate Hackett. He's you knew he was incompetent with Denver, and he's incompetent with the Jets. Well, so we're about to talk about trying, it. he was almost fired today. Yeah, well, they're trying to do old brick. Meanwhile, Bills head coach Sean McDermott has been verbally thrashed by some of the biggest names in the industry of national sports punditry, and fans seem kind of torn about it. They don't know what to make of the fact that their coach is getting the they're getting a rough ride. And that the coaching staff as a whole has kind of like it's they have to begrudgingly acknowledge that it feels somewhat broken. You know, it just does. And so when you think about those dynamics as it pertains to these two teams, doesn't it feel stupid that we're talking about a game that will decide who's in first place in the AFC East? Doesn't it feel kind of dumb when you say that out loud? Yeah. Both franchises are in shambles, and yet we are the best the AFC East has to offer. Quick question. Are we the worst division in the NFL right now? Possible. It used to be the AFC South, but Chris, if you want to give it a goog, just put it up here on the board for me. What is the current standing record of the AFC South? Uh, Tennessee's probably not good. There's the Jaguars and Titans are shit. Man, when you say shit, scroll up. Let me see it. Okay. So Titans one and three, Jaguars one and four. Okay, so they have six, seven, eight wins. They have eight wins as a division. What does the AFC East have? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we're tied in an in conference ineptitude. Scroll down to the NFC South, because this is what's interesting to me. They have had a crazy run of offensive production. Look at the points for inside that division. Right now, the Saints are a 2-3 and three team, and they've scored 140 points. Chris, go up to the AFC East. The yep. Bills have 142. Nobody else in our division has broken 100. <laughs> It'll be a while for the Dolphins and Patriots to get there. Oh, my there. God, the Dolphins have 60. <laughs> we might be the most inept division through the first five weeks of football. We might be the most fundamentally broken in the entire NFL. But there's still a playoff berth. And Chris... I don't care what you think about us. If you win, you're a winner, right? Yeah. If you make the playoffs, that's got to mean it's got to mean something, right? Yeah. So in that way, this game, as stupid as it sounds, has a lot of gravity to it. And so with that, we bring in tonight's guest so we can talk all about it. And here to talk about the utter absurdity of all of this. (laughs) 
<laughs> and just all of the poor optics and the crazy day that he's had as a Jets fan, Mr. Scott Mason from Play Like a Jet. Scott, how are you just in terms of, because like, I know you know you're here to do a football preview podcast, and yet at the same time, you're probably still digesting the news of the day, eh? Yeah, it's been a weird one, Drew. I woke up thinking I was going to do my normal routine this morning after getting to bed at about four or five in the morning, because as everybody that knows me knows, I don't really sleep. And I wake up and my phone is just lit up with texts. And my initial thought was that the Jets must have gotten a deal done for Devontae Adams. And that's why everybody is shooting me text messages and DMs. And I I actually got a text from Brian Bassett, who does a once a week show with his buddies, Travis Milton and Josh Conrad. And he said, do you want us to do an emergency show? And I was thinking to myself, yeah, it had to be Devontae Adams. And then I look and see all the text messages about Salah and all that. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And I think I told you guys for the first time in seven years hosting Play Like a Jet, I did two shows in one day. We had the show that went up like normal in the morning. And then we did a second one covering the breaking news of Robert Salah. It's, boy, this Jets season has been... Anything but you would have hoped if you're a Jets fan. It's just been all layers of chaos and insanity. And I guess in some way, I'm a fool for ever expecting it would have been any different. <laughs> there is some of that, right? Like you you look at it, like someone once said to me, that they were like, oh, well, hopefully something good happens. And I looked at him and I was like, why? Why Why would that ever happen to us? We're Bills fans. Like, why would something nice happen to us? And it's it's easy to see how Jets fans would feel that way, especially with just the – there are certain franchises. And Chris, like, you can – like, Robert Sala – let's start with this. Robert Sala leaves the Jets – as one of the losingest coaches in team history, right up there with a Rich Kotite, mm-hmm. someone Chris always mentions whenever we do. I yeah, love me some Rich Kotite. Whenever we talk about bad coaching <laughs> hires, it's the first name on his lips. And I, I get it, right? Like we talked about it. He was one of this week's um, you know, people who have it worst when we were talking. about. It. I, I already did a lot of punching down around Robert Sala. But what I'll say is this. He wasn't a great coach, but at the same time, you could have projected some of that after the last few years. And so Uh to have him fired for the reasons he's being fired now, just strike me as all kinds of crazy. I like how he went. I like how he went full Mac because he had to be removed by security. He just stood in his office. Try and move me, bro. (laughs) Try and move me. That's been disputed. It sounds like what actually happened is that the head of security walks Salah out to his car, which is, as you know, working in the corporate world, you guys, it's not all that uncommon that something like that would happen. I will say this, though. Drew, I think part of the issue here with Salah was for as bad of a job as it seemed that he has done the last few years, and I have so many complaints, the refrain was always, well, we can't really judge the guy yet because look at what he's had to work with a quarterback. You can't win in this league without it. They've won seven games with Zach Wilson and Mike White and Josh Johnson and Joe Flacco. So let's see what he could do with Aaron Rodgers, and then we can make the judgment. And now I think we've seen enough. uh, There's that guy, Dave Wasserman, for Cook Political Report. His famous phrase on Twitter is, I've seen enough, and then he'll declare a winner. I've seen enough. Robert Sella is not an NFL caliber head coach. And I think for whatever anybody wants to say about the chaos and we can get into what the theories are as to what made this happen and all the people that knew or supposedly didn't know. And I've got an, uh, a fun wrestling related conspiracy there. You, what you can say is especially the last two weeks when an Aaron Rodgers quarterback team, and I don't care if Aaron Rodgers isn't quite the guy he used to be. He's still been, at least an above average starter so far this season. If an Aaron Rodgers quarterback team is not getting a touchdown against the Denver Broncos, if they're getting waxed like that against the Vikings, and quite frankly, if they have to really gut it out on the road against the Tennessee Titans on top of all of that, and I could point to instance after instance where Salah was making questionable calls, where his game planning didn't make any sense, 
where he was getting thoroughly outcoached by the opposing team. I mean, look, the only game this year where Salo clearly was the better coach on the field was against New England. And I mean, New England's got no players on top of everything else. But I think at that point, you looked at it, and this is why Jet fans were talking about it all week. It was saying, listen, this season has an opportunity to slide into the abyss if they don't do something quickly because if they come home and lose to the Bills and they're 2-4, and four, they've, they've got to go right back on the road to But then right after that, they've got to play the Houston Texans on Thursday night football. So the, the chance of this season sliding completely out of control was right there. So the discussion was, would Woody have the cojones to do something like this? And everybody thought no, because he'd never done it before. And the Jets as an organization hadn't done it since 1975. But for whatever reason, and we have our theories and we can talk about it, they pulled the trigger. And the way I, I'll say it is, with Jeff Ulbrich, who takes over now, we saw what he did as head coach at the Senior Bowl, Drew Rave reviews. The players all like him. He's well-regarded as a coach around the league. Will he be a good head coach? I have no idea, but here's what I can tell you. We know that it wasn't working with Salah, so the change had to be made. Maybe it won't work out with Ulbrich, but at least there's a percentage chance that it will, and that's a greater percentage than you would have had if Salah was still here. I just retweeted something while you were explaining this. And I mean, that, that's a, I get it, right? But it's a funny meme about Sal. It's that thing of all the people sitting in the church pews holding guns to each other's heads. And then there's one guy in the balcony with a rifle and it says, Sala trying to fire Hackett, then getting fired by Woody Johnson while Aaron Rodgers lurks, waiting for his opportunity to take down Johnson and Johnson Pharmaceuticals once and for all. <laughs> I think here's the problem with the way it went down and the way I think this is the problem that the Jets have, right? The Jets as a franchise have a credibility issue and it it exists in almost every single level of the organization. You know, if we want to start, start at the bottom and work your way up, it starts at quarterback. You have a quarterback who says, hey, I'm retired and I'm I'm, I'm done playing. I don't know what my future looks like. And then he comes back and says, hey, I'm going to, you know what? I'm all in. I'm back. I'm the guy. And then he gets hurt, which is out of his control. But then when he comes back, he spends no time with the team. And then he starts playing games. And, well, it find, and then it turns out he's actually struggling to build chemistry with some of its more important players. Well, I got I to gotta correct you on that one, Drew. Sure. I assume you're talking about the two days that he wasn't there because of the Egypt trip. But mm. we should also point out. Well, I'm talking about OTAs. I'm talking about minicamp. Right. But we, but we should point out that he was at all the optional minicamp practices before that that he did not have to be at. So it's not sure. like he just no-showed for months. When, and then just showed up out of nowhere at training camp. So, so to be so, fair to Rodgers, let's be accurate on okay, that. Okay. But so, where was he during the offseason when every other quarterback in the NFL is getting together with their wide receiver teams and working out? It sure as hell wasn't working out with Garrett Wilson. And you're seeing the byproduct of that in the early mm -hmm. four or five games. Now, Garrett Wilson had a really good game this past weekend, at least statistically. And the problem is, is that I don't think Garrett Wilson is maybe as, you know, you and I have talked about this. When you're on a, when you're the best guy on a bad team, it might make you look better. And it might make people think that you project to being a better football player when you do get talent around you. And then the reality is you just become the same guy who, you know, I looked at the numbers. Justin Jefferson had almost the same yardage as Garrett Wilson last year, but he did it on 68 fewer targets and like 30 fewer receptions. So it's like, oh, Garrett Wilson accomplished something, but he needed a giant volume to get there. And that was never going to be what Aaron Rodgers did. He was never just going to look at Garrett Wilson and make him the workhorse. Now, some of the communication breakdowns the two of them have had, some of the issues, you know, you're starting to see Tyler Conklin all of a sudden become a functional part of the Jets offense again. It did the last two games, well three games because I think he went to sleep for a week and then he kind of came back. I know because my fantasy team is so bad. I had to pick up Conklin to be my starter. So with that said, he had no chemistry and you can see them slowly building it through the first couple weeks. He's now getting a feel for how Conklin runs routes. Conklin knows what the quarterback wants. They're building a relationship. The problem is you're going into week six of an NFL season. 
So when you're a quarterback who tells me like, hey, I believe that I can bring a championship to this team and I can do all these things and I'm not retired, I'm all in. And then you don't do some of the foundational things it takes to, uh, to, to make that possible. It's hard for me to take you seriously. And so even then, when you are telling the truth, when you are right about things, it is harder for me to take it seriously. Now, you go up a level and you look at Robert Sala. I always, I joke with you all the time. I think he sounds like Dom Toretto, <laughs> like a Dom Toretto character if someone had written him to be an NFL coach. I think he made a lot of comments and said a lot of things that he thought were necessary. And the reality is, I think that he's uh, probably a really good coordinator who just really struggled to understand and grapple with the pressure of managing the entire team as a whole and also having to understand what the offensive side of the ball needed and was doing and what they had going on because like early, that was a problem for Sean McDermott. It's why Rick Dennison was his first offensive coordinator and he had to fire that guy immediately because that guy was terrible. And then he found Brian Dable and the relationship that he built with Josh Allen grew and slowly grew and grew into something positive, positive enough that he got a head coaching job. And then again, he's struggled to kind of pick the right coordinator. He's had some success. He's had to fire another guy, but he at least got into it trying to understand that side of the ball. Cause that's where all of the jets problems seem to be rooted. And yet it, like, if anything, you want to say why he was like, that was his failing was just never really understanding what was going on over there. But then you hear all of this noise and conspiracy theory stuff about the how and why he was fired. And I think the problem you have is that the Jets are such an unserious organization and the credibility has been shot by the owner himself to a degree that when you hear conspiracy theories like, hey, Schefter's confirmed that the night before the, the coach is fired, you know, it comes out, people in the building knew that. Nate Hackett was probably going to get fired as early as Tuesday. And then Monday night, Aaron Rodgers, it's confirmed, has a conversation with the owner. And then the owner fires him. But then Wait, hang on, Drew. Who is reporting the, the conversation that uh, people Schefter. in the building thought? Schefter reported that. Okay, I hadn't seen that. Yeah, Schefter, rep, like it's, it's now being spun by more than one or two outlets. So this okay. isn't just hearsay. So mm-hmm. the idea was... It could have happened as soon as today. Then last night, Monday night, Monday night football is still going on. Apparently a conversation takes place between Woody Johnson and Aaron Rodgers. Now, right. according to Woody Johnson, they didn't talk about this at all. This never came yeah. up. Be- but in today's meeting, Woody Johnson said the idea to fire Sala was completely his. And that's why he did it. And he, it was his call. And I, you see all these people who go, well, it's really convenient that you had this conversation with a player who seemed to hold a lot of contempt for this coach who was about to fire his friend. And so you fired him preemptively. And I would want to believe about 60 to 70% of NFL owners who said that to me said, Hey, I was already going to do this. And we just had a separate conversation about other things. The problem is Woody Johnson has done nothing over his ownership. The Jets to tell me that he deserves the benefit of the doubt. I, I have a Brett the Hitman Hart Vince McMahon style conspiracy on this. You want to hear it? Sure. So I'm sure you know, and for the benefit of your listeners that don't know, I'll explain it very quickly. There's a famous incident that happened in WWF back in 1997. It was called the Montreal Screwjob. And here's what essentially happened. Bret Hart was WWF champion. And while he was under contract with the belt, Vince McMahon went to him and said, I had signed you to a 20 year contract, but I can't afford to pay you before I signed you WCW. Their main competition was very interested. They were offering you a lot of money. Why don't you go to them and see if they're still interested? So he did, he worked out a deal and Brett was going to drop the title and he was going to go to WCW. Vince wanted Brett to drop the title in Montreal to Shawn Michaels, who was his real life nemesis. Now, Bret Hart decided that he didn't think it was, and, and, and to be fair to Bret, he had what was a 60 day creative control clause in his contract. So theoretically he had the right to do this. He said he would drop the belt any other night to anybody else, 
but he would not lose it to Sean in Montreal. And you have to understand, Brett was a national hero in yes. Canada. Yep. So it was a big thing. Vince essentially relented, but behind the scenes, he and Triple H and Shawn Michaels and uh, the referee Earl Hebner and Pat Patterson and Gerald Briscoe had all basically conspired to screw Brett out of the title. And so what happened was during the match, when Brett was put in a submission hold, Vince had the timekeeper ring the bell and the referee signal the end of the match so that those people watching at home and in attendance would believe that the planned ending was for Brett to lose via the sharpshooter submission. When in reality, Brett had been screwed because he'd agreed to do no such thing. So anyway, the reason I'm bringing this up is because afterwards, and this is in the documentary wrestling with shadows, which I highly recommend watching triple H and Hunter backstage and Brett Hart is interrogating them and going, did you know about this? And Sean is saying, I swear, I swear on everything I, I, you know, everything in my life that I had no idea. And Triple H is saying, I have no clue. And Brett's sort of almost letting him off the hook until Bret Hart's wife, Julie, at the time, Julie says, you can swear to whoever you want, but we all know who knew what. And one day God is going to strike you down for this. And so Vince wanted everybody to play it off that nobody but him knew and he, well, him and the referee, obviously, because he would have had to participate. And nobody but him and the referee knew. And it was all him. And nobody else was in on it. And this way, he would get all the heat. And Shawn Michaels, who is his biggest star, would not have to deal with an angry Bret Hart, angry audience, Triple H, same thing, whatever. The fact that he spoke to Rogers the day before and says it was never brought up and this and that, it really feels a lot like Vince McMahon telling Shawn Michaels, I'm going to take all the heat for this. Don't worry about it. Pretend you didn't know. I could be wrong, but it just, I, I can't imagine that Woody Johnson is going to have his star quarterback on the phone the night before he's going to make this major decision. And that conversation isn't even going to, going to occur. I think it's more likely, and I have no evidence of this, so I just want to be clear. This is just me speculating it's more likely that Woody, who's been known to be influenced by the opinion of players in the past, Eric Mangini, who you brought up before, a big part of the reason he was fired is because Woody Johnson went to talk to a lot of the players at the end of the season, and it appeared the players had had enough of Eric Mangini. Maybe he was having conversations <laughs> in private with players going, What'd you th- what do you think of what Sal has been doing? Maybe he heard Quincy Williams in the locker room after the game say, we're tired of this every week. Somebody's got to be held accountable for this. Maybe he understood that there was some heat between Rogers and Sala with the cadence argument and all that stuff. But I find it incredibly hard to believe that Rogers wouldn't have known. It seems more likely to me that if anything, Woody would have said, Hey, I'm thinking of making this switch. What do you think? Or Rogers is talking to Woody and pushing him towards making the switch either way. I'm, I'm going to have to see some legitimate reporting and evidence that indicates that Rogers legitimately didn't know about this. Cause it just doesn't seem feasible to me. Uh, and like you said, I think they, they may have gotten the right result in a weird way, but now I will say the, that a lot of the fan base is galvanized and I'm hoping it does something for the team as well. Well, and so that's where we kind of segue into this. What is the team after the departure of Robert Sala? You know, you're, you're standing here talking about a team. I mean, if you want to talk about offensive football, the Bills over Bills and Jets over the last two weeks have been probably, I don't know. I mean, when you think about m- maybe two of the more depressing, that's the right word, depressing, Chris. Am I, am I doing this right? Like, yeah. I don't think frustrating – is what you would call it. I think what you'd call it is both teams know that their offenses are highly flawed. And to a, to a degree where I was more content to sit on a patio and just wallow in a beer than watch the end of the Houston game because it was gorgeous outside in Florida. And I wasn't going to let that derail. Like I wasn't going to let the bills belly flopping their way to (laughs) another loss fueled by offensive ineptitude ruin my enjoyment of the environment. And I'm sure that there's plenty of Jets fans who feel the same way. It's like, we know what's coming. 
How does replacing your head coach with your defensive coordinator and leaving the current staff in place, what is the direct benefit of your offense? Well, I will say, by the way, uh, for what it's worth, Peter Schrager hinted at this and so did Rich to many. There's not, there's the, the Jets are leaving all options on the table in terms of fixing the offense. And by all accounts, that means still potentially either demoting or outright getting rid of Nathaniel Hackett and replacing him either with somebody on staff or just bringing in a, a consultant from the outside to help. Either way, uh, they're, they clearly understand there's a problem with the offense. I also wonder if Robert Sella was involved in the offense to a greater degree than we realize, because remember, season all we heard was how Sala was going to have a bigger hand in the offense, and if he clashed with Rodgers, and this what we saw the last few weeks was the result. Well, then the tale tells itself. But as far as replacing Sala with Olbrick, I think what this comes down to is you had a head coach that the players had lost faith in, that had shown over and over again that he just wasn't up to the task, and with Olbrick. We don't know. He's never been a head coach other than that one week at the senior bowl. And he's well liked by the players on the team. He's done a very good job. One of the top defensive coordinators in the league, certainly the last few years. He's a guy that a lot of people thought might be a guy that would get interviews. He didn't this past off season, but maybe he would have this off season. And so what it comes down to is Jeff Ulbrich, I think, gives them a uh, new hope, a new lease temporarily. Now he's going to have to show why things would be different under him. Uh, well, so from what I under from what I understand, and, and this was what Semini was saying, it will be up to him what gets done as far as the offense. So, so does well, he have a better understanding of what to do than Salah? We're going to find out. Well, one of those things that we touched on, and it's something that I'm interested in whether or not we're going to see it ahead of this bills matchup. One of the flaws you and I have talked about a lot of times over on their AFC's Roundup podcast, it's come up multiple times now throughout the last few weeks, is this conversation that the Jets are relying on some of the, like, they're giving the highest snap percentages and the most touches to some of their most inefficient players. And that's a recipe for disaster for any football team. You know, he, here's a rookie in Malachi Corley who's not really being given an opportunity to play and see the field and make an impact, even though he was drafted with, as you know, obviously there was going to be a learning curve to playing wide receiver in the NFL, but there's, he had some tools that were unique, something that the Jets roster needed, and he hasn't been allowed to see the field and try to showcase any of them. And then you look at some of these other statistics where you say, Hey, Brees Hall has actually struggled a lot in terms of generating effective and efficient rushing. And yeah. so then you take a look at Braylon Allen and by, you know, by some of the more advanced metrics or even just some of the, look at this. I can pull up one right here. Rushing. Where are we? Yards per rush. Okay. Braylon Allen sits at nine yards per rushing attempt or receiving yards per reception. Cause this was the thing, right? And this is the one that was interesting to me the receiving portion of their game. I drafted Brees Hall early in fantasy football like a lot of people did because he was a three-down back who had all the skill sets and you could use him as a receiver and you can do all these things. Do you know he's averaging two yards per reception more than uh, or uh, Braylon Allen is averaging two yards per reception more than Brees Hall? And then you look at the rushing and you say, okay, well, obviously he's a premier rushing talent and that's why they, you know, that's why they trusted him. That's why everybody went out and drafted him highly in fantasy football. It's why he's getting more of the touches. You know, he's got 65 attempts on the season to Braylon Allen's 32, except Braylon Allen's averaging a yard and a half more per carry. <laughs> Brees Hall. And yet they continue to try to run the offense through Brees Hall. And so I start to wonder, is this not a question of, you know, giving him more touches to get Brees Hall going? If they don't need to just be more judicious with how they split those up, what impact do you think some of today's changes and some of the things that are going to take place this week? Do you think that this is the week the Jets actually start to address that? 
and you see them start to skew some of their touches and some of their targets towards these players who are more consistently producing for them. I think they're going to have no choice. I mean, obviously, as we record this, there's still all the speculation around Devontae Adams, and I think part of the value of of getting Adams, because somebody asked me the other day, wouldn't you rather have Amari Cooper, his contract, he, he's done at the end of the year, all stuff, and I said, no, because Devontae Adams is a unique situation with Aaron Rodgers. There's a built-in chemistry there that they don't need to work on. So right now you're waiting to see if that happens. But in the meantime, what's interesting, Drew, is you brought up the running game. And the running game is like a sphinx locked in a riddle. Because when you look at the statistics, it makes no sense. The Jets are um, in the bottom five in terms of facing light boxes, right? Right. Uh, mm-hmm. excuse me, in terms of facing um, heavy boxes, right? Mm-hmm. They face light box more than almost every team in the league. And yet they're bottom five in rushing metrics. And on top of that, they're also bottom five in yards before contact. So what does that say? It's Maybe not- it says that the offensive line isn't holding up its end of the bargain. Maybe it says that the play calling is bad. Maybe it says the running backs themselves have been bad, or maybe it's everything everywhere all at once. (laughs) So they have to figure out what to do there. It's confounding, right? Because they're facing what should be optimal conditions for a running back and still failing miserably. So, and then again, when you look at the running backs individually, you look at how bad they are before contact and it's like, okay, well, they're getting hammered from every direction. So if you can't run the ball at all, I, then, then you got to rely on throwing the ball and airing it out with Aaron Rodgers. And we've seen problems there. I mean, he threw three interceptions. He's not on the same page with all the receivers. Alan Lazard can't catch. So I think what, what, what they need to do. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Alan Lazard was the early savior of the Jets receiving game. <laughs> Well, the, 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 the crazy thing about that, Drew, is that Alan Lazard clearly has the best chemistry of any of the receivers on this core with Aaron Rodgers. And that's not he, a good thing. <laughs> well, no, good right, well, no, my point is, if you look at numerous times a game, you'll see plays that should be completions because of what I just said. The problem is Lazard can't catch. So a pass that would be caught by a better receiver but wouldn't necessarily happen because that guy wouldn't be in the right spot because he and Rodgers might not be completely in sync, that ends up being an incompletion anyway because Lazard can't catch it. So it's like a chicken or the egg scenario. But but the point I'm making is when the Jets are having trouble in the air and the Jets are having trouble running the ball, And now we've seen two weeks in a row, and you have to believe that Sean McDermott, who's not a stupid man as much as you don't like him, is going to be taking notes on this. The Jets were aggressively blitzed the last two weeks, and the result of it was the offense struggled because the offensive line could not stop it, and Aaron Rodgers, who traditionally has been terrific beating the blitz, was not terrific beating the blitz the last two weeks. So the question becomes... Is that something, is that just an outlier or is that something that Rodgers isn't as sharp with anymore? And can the offensive line get its act together? Is this a temporary thing? But if you're telling me they can't run the ball and you're telling me they can't do anything against the blitz, I mean, it's tough. It's not easy. No, it's not. And when you talk about the skill position players, it's interesting to watch. You know how I kind of touched on the growth of some of these guys over the last few weeks. One of the things that really kind of got the bills is when their pass rush didn't get home. And Chris, it almost feels like we're back to where we were. Remember when we lost Von Miller and all of a sudden our pass rush died in the vine. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. It feels like we're back in that place again where we just, and it's frustrating because you know, you're coming off a game against Houston where we had pressures Guys were getting to the quarterback. They just couldn't bring him down. Now you're playing a different type of opponent with a slower, less mobile quarterback. 
I believe that the Jets on offense are going to have to go with a little bit more of a quick strike offense. They're going to have to get the ball out faster because they know that Aaron Rodgers cannot, like he doesn't have the athleticism to evade the Bills pass rush the way that we just watched C.J. Stroud do it. So I'm interested to see how they change their philosophy. And if we don't get a heavy dose of Braylon Edwards, or Br- Braylon Edwards, Jesus, what a callback. Uh, Braylon Allen specifically because of that dynamic. And then also the ascension of Tyler Conklin is a useful piece of this offense has been really interesting because early on in the season, he was a forgotten man. And now you look at him and he's quietly just like climbing the ranks over the last week or two in terms of first downs, but especially first down against zone, which is something the bills like to run. He has seven of them. And when you figure he didn't start catching the ball until about three weeks ago, that's pretty solid production. Seven first down catches over the course of his last few games. And he seems to just have a feel now for what Aaron Rodgers wants, where he wants him to settle down in zone. And so in that way, I don't expect the Jets to to air it out, right? This isn't Nico. There's no Nico Collins and you didn't have an off. You wouldn't have an offensive line to protect Aaron Rodgers for long enough, even if you did. But at the same time, I see an offense that can do just about. I mean, I, Chris, if you had to give the wide receiver advantage in this, wouldn't you give it to the Jets? No, no, no. You think the Buffalo Bills wide receiver group is better than what the Jets are currently trotting out? Correct. Okay. Rogers has no chemistry with anybody except okay. Lazard. So, so Scott, you and I are Chris, s- sort of rash. Respectfully, Chris, respectfully, you're out of your damn mind. <laughs> and this is what I was about to say. Since we're, since we're literal, in- like literally, nobody else on earth thinks that, including the Bills coaching staff. Mm-hmm. So, with that in mind, you know, Mike Williams is slowly becoming a chain mover. You know, Alan Lazard's being, you know, you can almost start to phase him out if Aaron Rodgers can start to build some chemistry with these guys. But it really does come down to the offensive line, as it does in most football games. And for the Jets, it wasn't great this weekend. And some of that comes down to you're missing a tackle. You know, Morgan Moses misses the game. What do you think of the rookie? And what do you think? I mean, do you think that we're going to end up drawing him in this game? Or do you think Morgan Moses is supposed to be back? So... And this is just a guess, but when Moses went down, it was, I believe, September 19th. This game will take place on October 14th. We were told he would be out for potentially close to a month, Mm -hmm. and that would be about a month. And knowing Morgan Moses, he's one of the toughest guys in the league. I mean, last year, he played through a torn pec all year, which is insane for an offensive lineman. So I'm, I'm expecting that he'll be back. Now, I could be wrong. I'm just guessing. If it's Olu, listen, McDermott would be silly not to target the guy. All due respect to Olu, but in his first two starts out of position, by the way, because he was a left tackle being asked to play right tackle, Mm -hmm. he got annihilated both weeks against Denver and against Minnesota. And you'd have to watch that tape if you're Sean McDermott and the Bills and say, okay, let's go after this kid. Now, be fair. Tyron Smith hasn't exactly been great the last couple of weeks either, but you'd still like your chances better about confusing a young rookie like that than you would Tyron Smith, I would think. But if you're blitzing, you're going to have an opportunity to take advantage of the fact that Smith seems to not be able to handle that as well as he used to. And Olu (laughs) just doesn't seem to be able to handle it at all right now, especially playing at right tackle. So If you're a Jets fan, you got to hope that I'm right and that Morgan Moses comes back, which is always my prediction. If you're a Bills fan, you probably hope that he doesn't come back because (coughs) Olu at right tackle has been a very scary proposition in the first two weeks. Yeah, I'm looking looking here. Neither one of them have graded very well in terms of pass blocking, but we all know how those metrics, we know how that works. Tyron Smith. Tell me a little bit about this and then the interior of the offensive line kind of being, you know, John Simpson, Elijah Vera Tucker. The Bills defensive line started the season looking really good, but then we went up against two teams that had decent interior offensive lines and pretty solid game plans about how they wanted to attack us with the rushing. And you saw the front seven become kind of malleable. 
when you look at what you've seen from that interior group over the last few weeks, and then you think about the deficiencies that have kind of been exposed with the Bills front seven, how comp- how confident are you that this group that's going to be on the field Monday night can generate enough of a rush to allow the Jets to play a more conservative passing passing game and still stay in the game offensively? Man, I mean, that really depends on what the Bills are able to do. And I mean, this is an answer that you would probably have that would be better than mine is, you know, are the Bills capable of replicating something like what the Vikings and the Broncos have done the last two weeks, which is heavy blitzing and putting a lot of heat on the offensive line to make them go away. If they are capable of that, then I think it's going to be really, really tough sledding for the Jets to get anything going on the ground uh, or in the air. Um, it's just the, the offensive line has been weird. Like John Simpson, it's almost like that old Dennis green thing. He is who we thought he'd be like, he's basically an okay guard who gets p- flagged a lot for penalties. That's really what he is. Mm-hmm. He's okay. Vera Tucker has been very good. Mo- mostly he's been their best offensive lineman. Joe Tipman uh, has, you know, other than a week or two where he wasn't the best He's generally been okay. The interior has not been the major problem. The tackles have been an issue. Tyron Smith is having, you know, easily the worst year of his career so far. Uh, I think he let up nine pressures the last two weeks, which is unheard of for a guy who really, other than Trent Williams, is probably the best left tackle of this decade, right? This past decade. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then Olu, I mean, look, Morgan Moses played fairly well before he went out, but and again, he's playing out of position, and so that has to be taken into account. And he also is going into his third game here. He only played two games in the NFL, but he's been really tough to watch. That old line the last two weeks has not been good. The interior has been less of a problem than the two tackles, though. And I suspect the Bills will try to take advantage of that. And even if it's Moses, obviously he wouldn't be 100% healthy. So maybe you you try and and play with the injured guy as well. But if the Bills can bring that heat and they can, you know, set the pace early and everything, you could see something similar to what you saw with Denver and the Vikings where the Jets are, are struggling to run, struggling to pass, and struggling to score points. Look, I went on Arif Hassan's Norse Code podcast before the Jets and the Vikings game, and I gave him my honest opinion on what I'd been seeing and what, Vikings fans should expect. And he said something to me along the lines of, wow, this is incredibly depressing from a Jets standpoint. <laughs> but as a Vikings guy, it sounds good. And I texted him right after the game was over and I said, sadly enough, most of my analysis on your show turned out to be fairly accurate. And he just started laughing, going, yeah, sad but true for you. And I think that's that's what this is going to be like. And now, listen, can the Jets find a way to change up the offense? I mean, there's some funny stuff that was shown. I'm sure you guys saw the Dan Orlovsky clip that's been making the rounds where they needed one yard on a fourth down. So they hand the ball to Braylon Allen at a shotgun eight yards behind the line of scrimmage when he needed a yard. Yeah. And you're just saying to yourself, why are you making the running back gain eight yards for a first down? Right. Stuff like that is definitely correctable. The, the question is, like I said, with the running game, are the running backs just not able to perform to a level that we expected? Is it the line? Is it the coaching? And ultimately, Drew, this is one thing that I think you hit on before that has to be strongly thought, uh, talked about and thought about. If the guys with the premier names on the back of their jersey, one example being Brees Hall, are not getting the job done, how quick do you pull the trigger and say, okay, Brees Hall is struggling, time to run Braylon Allen. I think that's something that Ulbrich has to have in the back of his head. He has to be willing to adjust at the blink of an eye because it doesn't matter if the name Hall is on the back of your jersey and everybody drafted you second overall in your fantasy draft. What matters is who's getting the positive yardage, who's helping the team the most in that particular matchup. And if it's not going to be Brees Hall, right, or if Garrett Wilson is getting blanket covered, don't force feed the ball to him. Now, this past week, 
he did fine against Minnesota. They targeted him 22 times, but you gotta, you gotta read where the game is going and figure it out. You have to have the good game plan, obviously, but you also have to read where the game is going and figure it out as you go along, make adjustments. And people talk about halftime adjustments. It's not halftime adjustments. It's in-game adjustments, whether that happens in the first quarter, the second quarter, the fourth quarter, whatever it is, you've <laughs> got to be able to adjust to what's going on on the field. Salah has been terrible at that. Hackett clearly has been terrible at that. Does Ulbrich in charge and maybe some other behind-the-scenes moves with the offense change that? That's something that I can't answer right now. If they well, can't, it could be a long day. <coughs> <coughs> oh, God, I got I to get a cough drop. Well, the good news is we don't have to wait long. You know, it's just a few days away. It'll be interesting to see which team can correct their stuff. Hopefully, some of the things we're going to talk about in our keys to victory here in a moment. Hopefully, these are things the Bills can address because I don't know if there's much else they can do. This has always been a bad matchup for them. They have not played well. Josh Allen has not played well against this team. Some of the defensive statistics I have are pretty, it's pretty dubious that the Bills are going to, it's suddenly going to get easier for them. It'll be really interesting to see how this goes. I appreciate you joining us. Tell us, tell everybody where they can follow you on social media and where they can find the rest of your work on the Jets. Excellent question, Shelton. You can find the podcast anywhere you download podcasts. You can check us out on YouTube, youtube.com slash play like a jet. Our store is uh, uh, tpublic.com. That's T E E public.com and just search for play like a jet. Um, and also, I'm on Twitter at play like a jet one gentlemen. It's a pleasure as always. And hopefully they at least give us an entertaining game to watch. Uh, from my perspective, the jets have won the last two at MetLife stadium. I would like to see that trend continue, but I also would like to see things just start to turn around in general on the offensive side of the ball, because it's been very difficult to watch. Like I told you all I've, I'm not that hard to please. Give me a watchable offense for once. I'm I not going to lie. When you, Jets- when you said this, you were like, um, no, no. When you said that, all I can think of is hard to watch from 30 Rock. <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> the one that Tracy Morgan won a uh, a fake Oscar for. Right. <laughs> but I, I will say, uh, I, I want a, a fun offense. It looked like the Jets might be getting that after the Patriots game. And now it's gone back to what we we saw with Zach Wilson in a lot of ways just move the ball but don't do anything so hopefully that at least changes Scott Mason play like a jet play like a jet.com YouTube wherever you get your podcasts go listen to Scott's bullshit so that brings us to our keys to victory wow that's a lot of keys bigger the keychain more powerful the man I've only got two I've only got two for you the first one is is pretty obvious. It's that you have to find a way to solve because again, for the third week in a row, we are playing a team that does not play a lot of too high cover shells. Joe Brady has to acknowledge the fact that his current scheme that he was feasting off of early in the season will not work against this level of opponent, especially not when they have the coverage metrics that they do. They are the NFL's best coverage unit. Look at this, Chris. Like, if you look at their defense as a whole, second in passing defense, 14th in rushing defense, and fifth in points against. But if you dig into some of the finer numbers, what makes this such a bad matchup for Buffalo is the separation they allow. When they played Minnesota this past weekend, they won because of the Jets' ineptitude and the turnovers. Figure, what was the final score? It was like 20, 20, give it a goog, Chris. What, the Jet game? Yeah. 23-17, I think. Okay, so 23-17, you lost by six points. If you're the Jets, you lost by six points in a game where you threw a pick six to an outside linebacker. Your offense probably should have been enough to win you that game because you're, even though they were inept, your defense is that good. And it shows up in the numbers. Chris, when we talk about wide receivers being able to get separation, do you know who the highest player on the Vikings team for separation was? No. It was Jordan Addison at 3.0 yards. Do you know what that qualified for 41st in the NFL? 
In every play, this is players who had five or more targets. <clears throat> Jordan Addison, the leading receiver for Minnesota in terms of wide receivers you saw targets, 41st in separation. The week prior, in a game that they somehow, again, offense, inexplicably lose, Cameron Sutton is the leading receiver in terms of separation. For the uh, Denver Broncos, at 2.0 yards, which qualified for 64th in the NFL. Their coverage units are elite. And you can argue that it's because Sauce Gardner holds a ton, but it's a problem. And for a Buffalo Bills offense, you have an even bigger problem. Right now, your coverage units, like your team is not going to be able to get separation. And this kind of feeds into our second key, but you're going to struggle to do this. So here's what you're going to have to do, right? You're going to have to at least make sure that as an offensive line, you somehow keep the pass rush off Josh. Because if you give your wide receivers and your running backs and your release valves, you know, your Dawson Knox types long enough to work, they will make themselves available and find ways to be useful on offense. And through that, I think you can still operate a quality NFL offense, or at least an okay one. And not for nothing, they have one of the more dubious run defenses in the entire NFL because they sell out to stop the pass so viciously. But maybe that stops. Maybe that evaporates against the Buffalo Bills the way it has been every time we sit here and prognosticate that they can do it. It turns out they can't because schematically the box just gets full. They face heavy boxes, a lot more than a lot of other teams. In fact, I can get you the numbers on that. Chris, what do you think about the matchup of their defensive line against our offensive line, knowing all the stats that I've given you this week about how... I'm not going to like it. It's going to be... I mean, that's where the game's going to be won, is in the trenches. So here's what I want to see. Not rush yards over expected. That doesn't matter. I was looking for a fancy statistic on NFL next gen stats, but it doesn't matter. The reality is you have these players who for better or worse, our interior offensive line has not been getting the job done. At a certain point, you're going to have to look at inserting another player in there. If this doesn't stop, But right now, I don't know who to put in there. Connor McGovern, his move to center has not gone well. And now he's going to have to go up against Quinn and Williams and just a really disciplined and aggressive front seven for the New York Jets. I fear for this offensive line. I really do. And I don't know what that says for Josh Allen. I don't know what it does for the rest of our team, their ability to produce. I just think that we have to find a way to get an offense together that allows them to take advantage of the fact that they're a little bit weak in the slot. And that's about it. Maybe take their aggressiveness and use it against him. The way that the, the way that the Raiders, the, the Raiders, the Ravens did against us, the slip screens to the running backs. Whenever we would get guys into the backfield against the Ravens, they would dump off a short pass knowing that they had already committed linebackers upfield and it was off to the races. It's going to take a giant philosophy shift from our offensive coordinator and a great job by our offensive line in order to get the Bills to produce anything remotely looking like an NFL offense on Monday night. And the other thing that they're going to have to do if they want to win this game, because I believe that our defense will be able to hold serve. Chris, they have to shuffle the deck completely a wide receiver. Yeah, they do. Curtis Samuel had one target for no yards. And through, a, for what, five weeks? It's he's been wildly g- ineffective. It's embarrassing how much money they paid him to have no statistical impact on football games. And then you look at this. Mac Hollins and Marvis Veldez Scantling through five games. 302 snaps, 26 targets, eight receptions, eight catches. Between the two of them through five weeks, 99 yards, 3.8 yards per target. So they're making themselves available 
And then they're just not making plays when they're called upon. You've reached a point where you went into the season thinking you knew guys. I talk about this before. Would you go? I know that came. I know that Samuel can do X, Y, and Z. And then the, the bullets start flying, and whether it's because of the toe injury or whatever you have, it turns out he can only do Z, and he doesn't even do Z well. And you go, okay, shit. Well, there was a whole part of my offense that I thought I was going to have that has to get redesigned. All right, well, at least I have MVS who can do long, long passes and I can trust him to run post routes. Oh, shit. He doesn't catch the ball when I throw it to him either. Well, at least I have Mac Holland. To, oh, shit. He doesn't catch the ball either. Well, now what, Chris? What do you do? I think at this point, the most refreshing thing that you can offer Josh Allen and the rest of the offense is to shuffle this depth chart a little bit. First of all, if the toe injury to Curtis Samuel is so significant that he cannot go out there and compete and perform at least at Isaiah McKenzie levels, then you need to seriously consider putting him on IR and just letting him get healthy. Put him on IR, let him roll for seven weeks. If we're still in playoff contention, you can add him back in and hopefully he'll have some juice. Because right now he's useless. Chris, he's like you trying to play offensive line in a yes. pickup football game. He's like you in a barbecue, like uh, like in a rib contest. Like he's you trying to judge ribs. I would never do that ever. <laughs> he's you trying to pick out quality haircuts on a board at Supercuts. I could do that. <laughs> the fuck you can. Look at what's on your head. <laughs> Meanwhile, you've got guys like Terrell Shavers, who caught a first down pass. <laughs> Terrell Shavers made a big play in a game against Houston. You go, hey, wait a minute. Maybe that's a guy I need to lean on. I need speed. You know who we haven't looked at is KJ Hamler. Maybe it's time. The break glass in case of emergency time might be right now. Because for as dire as everything feels, you still have a path to being in the driver's seat of your terrible division. But if you keep trusting these guys who have proven to you, especially in a game where they've got tape on these guys, they know their tendencies, they know the plays you like to use them in, they like a, they know the Jets are going to come into this knowing a lot about how you're going to use both of these players, at Mac Collins, MVS, and they're going to mitigate and take them away. You got to throw something different at them. Khalil Shakir. Him coming back will help. But if you want this to be different, you might have to start asking that you might have to start asking different questions. Not what more can MVS do, but why am I giving MVS and why am I giving Curtis Samuel snaps when there's guys out there who might also be able to make an impact that also, by the way, my opponent doesn't have any tape on. It's just food for thought. But I think, to me, that's one of the most important parts of this game. You have to find a curveball for the Jets' defense. And if you don't have one, you will, Chris, this will be another slow, embarrassing, painful game to watch for the Buffalo Bills. Better not be. You got a prediction? Uh, Everybody gets out safe. That's it? Yes. No, prediction, not a hope. Well, have you seen the field that they play on? Yeah, that's I want a hope. everybody. Yeah, I want everybody I to want, get out safe. What do you think is going to happen? I think you might throw a beer against your fireplace. <laughs> that might be a thing, uh, and you might also flip a sofa. This is a terrible philosophical matchup for the Buffalo Bills. This is the Ravens, just in a different way. And honestly, if the defense can't make a couple splash plays. Like, they're going to have to. It's going to take the defense being oppressive in this game. They're going to have to bring it. They're going to have to make turnovers. They're going to have to force punts, win a field position battle. Because if they let this thing turn into the Jets, hey, we can go up and down the field. And, oh, by the way, the Buffalo Bills can't move the ball at all. It's I'm going to end up laying face down on my basement floor with a Manhattan in my hand. Listen to, uh, well, what is it, Simon and Garfunkel? Sure. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Yeah. We lose another one to the Jets in New Jersey and also give up the one seed in the AFC East. 
it's not going to go well. <laughs> like it's not going to be a good time in the gear house. Guys, I hope I'm wrong. I hope that this dread that I'm feeling in my chest, I hope it's found I hope it's ill-founded. I hope that Sean McDermott hears the criticism that he's been that's been levied on him. Chris, remember the last time he was publicly attacked like this? And then he went on a run? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe this is what we needed. We needed everybody in the national and local media to come out and just lash out at this guy. Well, I did say like what, two weeks ago, you know, don't forget our we're still gonna have a lull. Usually it's the end of October, beginning of November, where we go a five game stretch where we go two and three, three and two. Yeah, but we're usually Wheels already five coming. and but yeah. we're already usually it's five and two. It's happening now. It's happening we're, now. We're already usually five and two. Hopefully this is how we get another step closer to reaching that. I did say at the onset of the season that the Bills would be three and three after six games. I expected that. Now I'm not gonna lie to you. We have an opportunity to be four and two, and I will be pleasantly surprised if they can do it. If not, I won't be viscerally upset, even though I will be upset in the moment. But if you can get to four and two, and then you look at what's ahead of you, I think that you can make the case that this team might be capable of holding on to something here in the AFC East and might still be able to keep its playoff hopes alive. Because if you lose that to Divi- Chris, at this point, wild card almost seems like it's out of the picture, doesn't it? No, we're winning the division. If you lose to a dysfunctional Jets team with no offense to speak of, and your offense can't find another gear, it can't find a way to get out of these schemes that are very easily foiled by single high safety looks, like we talked about in our recap show, then you're going to die out here. And if you do, you're no longer talking about the Buffalo Bills as a playoff team. And I don't want to live in that universe. So let's hope they take care of business. I can't wait, but for tonight, we got to get the hell out of here. I'm Drew Gear. That's Chris Kruger. That was Scott Mason. And this has been your Week 6 Preview.